Campus Comics Cast. Uh, this is Scott Reed, and I am joined by Mike Atchison. Atchison. Yeah, <laughs> John Schubert, and Mike No. And the sad part is, is that we went over that order like right before. The start. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> it wasn't the order I got confused with. It was my mute button. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, you, you heard that correct. Mike No is back with us for an episode yes, of the podcast. This is, my, this is my comeback special. That's yes. right. Mm-hmm. So it's been about uh, 40 something episodes since Mike's been on. So we're yeah. glad to have you back with us for an yeah. episode. And I do appreciate the fact that since this is the 100th episode All of the right, podcast, good. you were so excited about the podcast um, that you decided to make a dramatic change to the store just so that we could announce it here on the podcast. Yes, that's <laughs> right. So we'd have something to talk about. That's I knew right. You guys were running dry without Dan to, you know, keep the shows <laughs> going. Yeah. You know, because we had the, we had the big episode 50 where, uh, where we brought Dennis back to talk to him. So now mm-hmm. we had to do something special. 100. So what did you decide to do? Move the store move just the so store. we have stuff to talk about for our 100th episode. That's so. right. And not just move the store. I moved to another town. Move the store to another town. So, And change the name. And change and the name. So let's start there. What is the new name of what was formerly known as Campus Comics? Well, I think... Uh, to give a little background to it, I did move the store to Murfreesboro, um, which is where I happen to live. So it's a convenient sake. It's one of the factors to moving and leaning into the whole Murfreesboro legends of Murfreesboro. I've changed the name of the store to uh, Muddy Monster Comics yeah, as an allusion to the local cryptid the Big Muddy Monster, which, of course, is named after the Big Muddy River that flows just outside of town here. And it is a Sasquatch-type creature that has appeared over the years. So we are going with that theme and that name, Muddy Monster Comics. So that's what we are now. All right. So and then what what is the address of the new store? The address of the new store is 1422 Walnut Street, in Murfreesboro. Uh, The phone number has stayed the same. And for those of you who aren't super familiar with Murfreesboro, you actually were actually on the same road as we are now, just (laughs) the next town over to the west. Okay. So you don't even really have to take any turns off of that. You just have to get into town and look for 14th Street. And we're just on that block, on the 1400 block of Murfreesboro. So you are getting pretty close now for your grand reopening. Yes, so uh-huh. why don't you tell us when when that grand reopening is going to be? Okay, that will actually be May the 1st. Not quite Star Wars Day, nope. but a few days before. But May 1st um, is when we're going to be opening. We've been pretty much closed for the last two weeks. People have been able to come in and pick up their pull books if they want but we've not been open to the public you know general public and you know until may 1st okay all right so i guess that's you you know you brought up pool customers so Mm -hmm. um, so as far as comics go is there going to be any changes for pool customers uh no not really It'll, it'll pretty much stay the same i think we've always maintained you know the policy as much as you can enforce anything, you know, with that kind of thing, but, you know, just kind of like to have a three, you know, three comic, the three title minimum, you know, and haven't really enforced that, but I would really like to see that. Okay. But now really same old, same old, you know, as far as that goes. Okay. So um, you mentioned that like the contact information for buddy monster comics is going to stay the same. So phone number is. Uh, 618-457-6011. Uh, the 
change has already been made to the Facebook page. I know that the name is still attached to that page. So if you look for Campus Comics, the Muddy Monster Comics page will will pop up. And it, I, the reason I did that, you know, just change the page is that way we retained all the likes and the follows and everything mm-hmm. from the Campus Comics page. So we just retained all that. Oh, yeah, that makes so, sense. <laughs> yeah. Don't want to lose all that and start again. No, no. (laughs) Yeah. Might actually break a thousand followers, you know, because I remember when I had to have a little push to get to the 500th follower. Mm -hmm. And now I think, uh, or like, or whatever. But now I think we're at like 983 followers. (laughs) I know. Nice. Since since I've announced the, uh, the change and... The move and everything. I think I mentioned this to a couple of you guys. Is since I announced that we've gotten like 140 new page likes, you know, from mostly Murfreesboroans. I don't know if that's the name of a person that lives in Murfreesboro, <laughs> but we'll go with that. But uh, mostly from that, you know. So uh, there's quite a bit of excitement. I've been fielding mm-hmm. probably three or four phone calls a day. You know, it's weird to not answer the phone, Campus Comics. I have to, you know, think the Muddy <laughs> Monster, you know. And but getting probably three or four phone calls a day, you know, asking if we're open, you know. So I think people are, are interested in what's happening up there and are ready to, to come in and check us out. All right. So what are some of the new things that are going to be offered at Muddy Monster? Um, we're we're going to kind of... You know, since we're not going to, we're looking for more walk-in traffic, you know, is what we're, is one of the ideas behind the move. And Murfreesboro is doing a pretty good job about revitalizing their downtown. They've got a really active uh, Murfreesboro Main Street organization, and they do a lot to promote local business. Um, So we're looking more to capitalize on that, because we've got to come up with things that people will buy, because not everybody's going to buy a comic book, you know, and, and I understand that it is a specialty market for a reason. It's just, well, it's do we a, care about a, those people? Um, <laughs> well, I care about their money. I don't yeah. care about those people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but no. Also, we have a little bit broader appeal and not necessarily, without veering too far from what we get, you know, get into other areas of interest and probably broaden the spectrum, to speak, of the merchandise that we carry get a little bit more into general merchandise, you know, that it's still fit with the theme of what we do. So, well, I know that it's going to become more of a family business, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. My daughter is opening up. Sarah, you owe Scott the thanks. I wasn't even going to talk about her, but yeah, she, <laughs> yeah, my, my daughter's going to be opening up her shop within a shop. Um, ooh, there we go. We got some graphics going on there, huh? But uh, she's going to be opening up a shop within the shop of selling her crocheted, hand crocheted goods. So it's going to be a little bit more wide variety of stuff as far as, you know, her crocheted characters and blankets and things that she does and handcraft and more of the good smelly stuff that women like, you know, you know, and then you got going into the go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah. Well, as I said, then you're also working with what the muddy, muddy monster. Oh, yeah. Thing. yeah. What was that about? So yeah, we are also we're uh, talking to some people. There's a uh, there's actually been a documentary film made about the big muddy monster, and uh, there's actually I talked to a guy, the author today, Chad Lewis is his name, who's written a, a book about it. And so I'm going to be carrying both DVDs of the documentary and hard copies of the uh, of the book about the legend of the Big Muddy Monster and the sightings and the other things that that go along with that. So, you know, if I would not be opposed to the idea of actually serving as somewhat of a, a the Big Muddy Monster Museum kind of thing, you know, I'm gonna yeah, I actually the if you go to the Murfreesboro website you can actually view the police reports and even the witness sketches and everything that they made of the creature during the sightings and I'm going to enlarge those and use those as the wall art you know 
around the store. Some of it, you know, of course, there'll be stuff in there as well. But we will have some you know, display stuff so people can read a little bit. That leads to another thing, you know, that we've got that works too. I don't know if you want to talk about that or we can just talk about that later. But there's some other stuff going on about the Big Muddy Monster doings. Okay. Uh, there, the brewing company in yes. Murphy. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Wait, yeah, I was going to bring that up. Oh, okay. Well, Mike, <laughs> hey, Mike, why don't you ask him about this the comic shop? Because I've always said two of my favorite things are beer and comics, so uh, I've yet oh, to yeah. find a store with that. <laughs> right. So there you go. Well, we're going to have to back up on the beer part and just go with the root beer at this point. <laughs> All right. The big Muddy, the Big Muddy Brewing here in Murfreesboro uh, does uh, brew a root beer because that's a whole different market and licensing I'd have to get into, Mike, <laughs> with that other thing. I understand. So, um, yeah, we're going to be carrying the Big Muddy Root Beer in the store. It's going to be, and we've actually, I've actually talked to the people at the the brewery and they're you know excited about having us just actually build as the official drink of muddy monster comics is going to be the big muddy root beer i actually got the little it's like a wine cooler actually you know a wine refrigerator it's got the glass front i actually got that in today and got that located they're going to provide some signage and everything like that so we'll have their root beer in the store so local business Promoting local business, that's, you know, kind of what I'm moving to Murfreesboro for, because mm -hmm. that didn't happen much where we were at previously, so. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, how Murfreesboro does a pretty good job of promoting the downtown stuff, and it's like you just yes, got they really do. new awnings and put up without, like, a grant, right? Yeah, like, wasn't the, the new awnings, like, as part of a grant? Yes. Yes, I think they got some funding from the city for a, a grant from the... Uh, the Murfreesboro Main Street and the city. And I think you'll see that as you drive through Murfreesboro, several businesses are getting new awnings and sprucing up storefronts, you know, with the uh, help from the city. So we're excited. We've got a big bright red one. Yes. You know, so be easy be to spot. To miss. <laughs> yeah. Be easy to spot. So once you get close, once you, if you're coming into town and you get close to 14th Street, the bright red awning is, is us. So we're, you'll be easy to spot us. <laughs> and you're working on a promo oh, comic, yeah, right? Like I said, we're super excited about it. Yes, we are. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, working with the local writer, uh, Brian Easton, who's a Murfreesboro native, who is a published author of a, of a uh, what's the word? Of? Series of books <laughs> called the called The Autobiography of a Werewolf Hunter. Brian is writing the comic for us, and we're using uh, a local friend and customer, longtime friend of the store, Nathan Bonner, is going to be doing the, uh, the main interior art of the comic. Um, he actually, I've already seen the splash page for, for that that he had sent to me, and it's dynamite i absolutely love it we're actually <laughs> gonna uh enlarge that and have it you know on display there at the store with like a coming soon kind of thing you know about about the comic book that's coming uh working title for it so far we're gonna go with big muddy monster a true story of murfreesboro mm -hmm. you know to kind of promote that and used in conjunction with the city to promote you know tourism and stuff like that and uh, getting a lot of local artists to do uh, gallery pages in the back, you know, full page, you know, pinup style art like you used to see. You know, I guess they still do, you know, but yeah. like back, we're just different artists take of the subject matter. Um, so what we're really looking at is a 32 page book with 20 pages of story. And we're leaving, you know, several pages in the back for uh, the gallery pages from the artists and then we're going to leave a blank page for a draw your own big muddy monster <laughs> and people can bring those into the store mail them in whatever and we'll have a place in the store to you know to display all those that we oh, get in that's cool and so some of the artists that we're getting are uh justin holman joe dodd matt speroni matt miller 
Um, you contacted somebody, didn't you, Scott, to get them yeah. to do it? It's not official yeah. yet, though, so well, I'll hold okay. off on saying right. anything about that. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm I'm trying really hoping I don't forget anybody, you know. But uh, well, I don't want to I don't want to mention any names in case they said no or something. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> okay. So guys, I haven't had anybody say no yet. Okay. All right. So, yeah. So. So, the, so those are the few of the artists. And if you've been into the shop when we've had our get-togethers and we've had local artists and everything, and you've met you've met most of these guys. So, you know, so I'm really excited about it. I've seen a couple of pieces of artwork already, and uh, I'm just, it just gets me more and more excited. <laughs> you know, they've got some really cool stuff. And, and it's going to be in the vein of a creepy or eerie magazine. Uh, we're, you know, we're going to have black and white interior uh, with a color cover oh there's the cover or the cover okay, gotta, what am i talking yeah. about yeah brad moore who's uh pretty well known in circles of heavy metal album buyers you know his artwork has been featured in a lot and a lot of heavy metal covers and he actually brad has actually had a show with hr giger the creator and designer of the xenomorph from the alien movies and I believe he still, I believe Brad still has a piece on display in Giger's museum, at least one piece, maybe more. But I'm not really sure on the particulars on that, so don't quote me on that. But I know he's pretty involved. <laughs> I know Giger was a fan of Brad's. Oh, okay. You know, so so he's going to be the the cover artist. So we should have a full color cover with black and white interiors, like I said, in the vein of the old creepy, eerie. Okay. EC, you know, Tales from the Crypt kind of thing. <laughs> That's another cool thing, too. You know, we're going to be using, there's going to be two versions of the story. One's going to be the 20-page book for now. Mm -hmm. We're going to do an expanded graphic novel later that's going to be a, a historical fiction kind of thing. And uh, we're using my, if anybody knows me from back in the day, working conventions before I had the store is, and my eBay store was No Man's Land, and my mm -hmm. character was the No Man, which was <laughs> basically a caricature of me that served as like a crypt keeper. And he's going to be the narrator of the story and everything along, you know, in the vein of the crypt keeper. But one mm -hmm. of the cool things is I've t approached the city about it, about using it, like I've said, and uh, the mayor, uh, Will Stevens, had actually reached out to me and said, hey, what would it cost me to get a cameo in the book, <laughs> you know? And I said, well, not a thing, you know, that <laughs> since we're going to do a promo comic for the 20 page, for the comic books version of it, which is going to be for tourism, we're actually going to repl replace the no man with the mayor. Ah, and, okay. you know, and he's, so he's going to be the nar narrator of that, you know, so that's how Will, he's like, oh no, Will was like, Oh no no! Don't do that. The no man needs to be in there. I'm just talking. Draw me in the background. You know, <laughs> you don't even have to say who I am. Just I just want something to show my kids when they're older. You know is what he said. <laughs> no, that's cool. And I said, well no. I said, well no. I said that's that's awesome. I said I'd be more than happy. I said we'll still have the no man on the front because I think what we're gonna go with is like no man's land press or something like that. You know, and then and then for the graphic novel historical fiction we're gonna have the no man as the narrator. So I think we're going to go that direction with it. Too. No reason why you can't just do a Cain and Abel thing where you've got <laughs> both of both. Oh, you know? that's true. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. True. Yeah. So because yeah, the mayor has a very distinctive look too, so which we'll translate <laughs> later. He always wears a, he's a very dapper dresser, like wears, you know, retro suit and coat and always wears a fedora, you know, so <laughs> that's kind of his thing, you know, so, so it'll translate. Well, I'm, I'm very, I need to shout it up at it, but I'm very excited about this project. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, okay, I may be wrong here, but I thought I thought you told me that that your No Man logo was designed by your daughter. Is that correct? The no, no. Yeah, the, the No, no Man's, Man's Land. Land. Yeah, your No Man's Land logo yeah. wasn't that designed by your daughter? No. no oh, okay. She, she did like some artwork for me, you know. Okay. Of course, she did it on a poster board and stuff like that. No. The No Man's Land logo is actually designed by the same person that's doing the Muddy Monster Comics logo, Tony Philippi. Okay. You know, they're they're a silkworm, you know. Oh, okay. He's, he designed both of those you know, oh, okay. characters. Yeah. So 
I, I must have misrepresented that or said some things that led people to believe that before, because that's not the first time I've heard that, Scott. So, okay. All right. Yes. So well, maybe it was you just, must have been. Maybe I just misunderstood that. I thought she had done it, but maybe she just did the initial mock-up or something like that. So. I think she did. Yeah. I think she did some stuff for me with that. But, all right. Okay. So I have one more but question. That, but there's the changes there. All right. So, okay. Sure. So one of the things that had gotten pretty popular pre-COVID was you were doing some mini cons, mm -hmm. yes. you know, and, and bringing in artists and and even some other comic book dealers. Yes. Um, are you? Do you have plans to continue that moving forward? Yes. Absolutely, I really do. Yeah, and I think we can actually with the new location, I think it will provide maybe a venue to where we can expand that. You know, because actually on the same block that the store is located on. Just previous before getting to that is is what's called the Davis McCann Center, and it's actually it's like the township offices are in there, but it's also got a space where probably will hold like I don't know ten to twelve tables I would say in there. So you know I, there and the, then even further up the street, closer in the area of the Liberty Theater. You know, on the, that side of the street is, you know, the Murfreesboro Event Center, which is a little bit larger and everything. So, I mean, I think this just gives us a chance to expand what we were doing with the mini cons, Scott. Wow, cool. So I think we could, you know, and I, of course, the mind's running wild, you know. So, you know, if we get into the Muddy Monster Comic Con, we got MMC squared, MMCC, <laughs> you know, so... So I'm already thinking there. There you, you know go. I mean, I, yeah, the mind runs away with me, as my wife tells me often. <laughs> you need to rein it in a little, Mike. You know? <laughs> I don't want to rein it in. I just need to pace myself. It I could be like C2E2, you know? but it'd be M2C2. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, M2C2, and that's the way it gives you MC squared. MC you know squared. what I mean? So, right. so yeah, F, F for fun, F equals MC squared. <laughs> you know? So. We even got a formula for it. All right. So. All right well, uh, Mike, you got any questions yes. for the other Mike? You got any questions for Mike about uh, the shop? Uh, uh, any got questions for the no man? Yeah, there so. you go. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I mean, first of all, I already kind of know the answer because I've been inside the, the, the space. But okay. uh, just how big is your store and, and how do you feel that your uh, the utilization of this new space is going to benefit um, – you and your customers uh, compared to the previous well, location? Um, well, where we're at is, as, as we all know, one of the reasons for my departure from my previous digs was my inability to fully use the space I had. You know, the back room was always an on again, off again. Is it usable? Is it not usable? Is it usable? And finally, it just got to the point where I just don't think it's going to be permanently usable. So, I had about 1,800 square feet total at the old location, and uh, about five to 600 of that was in that back room. So I'm actually, where I'm going now, the store itself, the front itself, is uh, about 1,700 square feet. So I'm about... Well, I've gained a lot, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I've, and then I have another 700 square feet of storage that's in the back. So we're going from about 1,100 to 1,200 square feet of usable space to about 2,400 square feet of usable space. Wow. And if you take the 700 feet out of the back and Sarah's stuff's got about 200 square feet up front, we're about, we still have a net positive gain, you know, mm -hmm. over the square space. And I think it's just a lot more, for want of a better word, user-friendly. It's a more <laughs> open, straight shop kind of space. And the other thing that I absolutely just love is we're going from the ceiling height that we had there at the old location, you know, where there was a drop ceiling. And so it was probably about a seven-foot height, you know, I would guess over there which wasn't terrible but we're going to a, it's got to be a 10 foot height i haven't measured it but i think we got 10 foot ceilings where we're at so it just gives you a lot more open and a visual appeal you know it's just, it doesn't feel quite right. so cave-like <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> with the the lower drop ceiling and everything and the better lighting and 
you know, just it's it's just a much better. It's a step up <laughs> for sure to me. So I would agree. Did completely. that answer your question, Mike? Or oh yeah, absolutely. Again? I like okay. the location across the street from the the old Liberty Theater too. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, mm -hmm. we looked at that spot, but what we ended up um, not. I, I kind of preferred that location itself, but the building just didn't, it didn't work, you know, because right. there wasn't any, there wasn't any storage, you know, is, is what we were really going to be hurting for. And I say I like that location better, but I kind of don't, I kind of feel like maybe we are the thing too that can bring that business corridor another block or so to the west, you know, towards that way. So I think I'm actually want to talk to the city too to see if they would let me paint footprints on the sidewalk. You know what I mean? Like muddy awesome. monster footprints oh, like cool. they do with the Saluki dog, but on a much smaller scale because we're trying to draw, you know, footprint, foot traffic down that mm -hmm. way. So I want, kind of want to see if they'd, they'd let me do that kind of thing, you know, <laughs> kind of follow the footprints down to the muddy monster comics. So, so yeah, on the, on the grand opening, too, we'll have a dude in a Bigfoot suit. You know what I mean? We'll have that, you know. Not a Bigfoot, a Buddy Monster suit. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> there, is, there, is, there is a big Muddy Monster suit out there. But because um, the only difference, you know, is the big Muddy Monster is light colored, white to silvery white. It's been described as. So the guy in the Bigfoot suit will be a black suit. But um uh, but the big muddy monster suit is like a light colored, but the maximum height like is five ten, that a person can wear that. The guy coming in the big muddy in the bigfoot suit is like six seven, six oh. eight, you know. So <laughs> it's gonna be impressive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, right, so he's got another really question. excited about it. No, I, that, I think it covers it. All right, Chad, what about you? You got some questions for Mike about the store? Um, well, um, for the opening day for, for May 1st, is there anything that we want to tell everybody about? Is there, are there any, I don't know, specials or guests or anything? I know you mentioned the mon the, the Bigfoot yeah. will be there. Yeah, the, the Bigfoot will be there. He'll just be kind of wandering around. I really haven't had time to think <laughs> too much, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, I get that. It, it's been, this move has been ridiculous, I gotta say, you know, it's just, it's been a long, protracted move, and I got to give a huge shout out to to our host there, Scott. He's been I would be nowhere near to where I'm at if it hadn't been for his help, and my sister in law Joyce Lee, who's loaned her you know let herself and her truck and her trailer, Scott and his truck. Other than that, you know. Hey, I didn't see the other two guys around anywhere <laughs> helping us move over. <laughs> no. All in general, I would have I been. I know you would have. Mike was out of commission. You know, people have lives. Yeah. I understand that. And Scott just took a big chunk out of his, as did Joyce. She happens to be retired from SIU, so she was available. So, I mean, I, I totally understand. I get it. And you know, that was just, Dave. I forget his name. Dave, Dave Taylor. Yeah, that helped yeah. you out a bunch as well with boxing yeah, up stuff. Yeah, he helps me out more within the store. I think mm -hmm. he helped move a couple of things, a few yeah. days, you know, a little bit that one day. But Dave's my go-to guy for, you know, I mean, I know he's going through some personal stuff right now. He's going to have to fly out. To, I don't think his dad's doing well. Yeah. So he's going to have to fly out to Connecticut, you know, you know, for some unpleasantry family things. But uh so he hasn't, you know, I, he, I haven't seen him in a little bit, but yeah, Dave is my guy, you know, as far as he's, he's a worker now, you know, so I'm sure he'll help out when he gets back, but. Were the, yeah. the Ghostbusters something going to be there? on the Oh floor? yeah. Yeah. I'm so sorry, man. I don't know where my brain is. See, see, I, you can, I've had a brain, brain injury guy. <laughs> you know, so I need to poke the cerebellum once in a while to get me thinking here. But yeah, actually, I think they've undergone a name change from the Indiana, Kentucky Ghostbusters. I think they're now rebranded as the Shawnee Valley Ghostbusters. Uh, they're going to be there, hopefully, with their new Ecto vehicle. I know it's close to completion, 
But even if they don't come with the vehicle, you know, they're going to be there with their proton packs, you know, and their, <laughs> their giant inflatable, you know, stay puffed marshmallow man, you know, so we'll have some stuff going on things there. I was hoping to get, you know, to get the mystery machine in, but apparently he's permanently out of commission, I guess. He even took his Facebook page down. So, so I think he, I think his uh, mechanical problems he was facing last year, you know, just must have taken on a, a life of their own. We're insurmountable. So hopefully we'll <laughs> see a new, new mystery machine, but that's kind of what we're wanting to lean into. We're wanting to lean into the monsters, you know, as, along with the big muddy monster um kind of stuff you know I, i'm not gonna get full blown into cryptids that's just a local legend here you know so i want to lean into that uh but we also want to get more into what i like to call family friendly horror i am not a slasher flick fan you know i mean i'm you know and and the ghostbusters people will say hey we can bring freddy krueger this and that you know it's just like i no i don't want to terrify the children you know <laughs> what i mean <laughs> i want to get more into you know the family friendly horror one of my first loves is universal monsters and you know so definitely with the universal monsters you know which is of course the the images that is in our you know our pop culture psyche of what frankenstein and dracula are you know with the bela lugosi and boris karloff and you know and then into the creature from the black lagoon and the you know these things that are horror in name old link you know it's more mm -hmm. about this is the kind of stuff i want to get into and then of course scooby-doo is the, <laughs> the perfect culture you know what i mean for it you know just the the fun campy silly stuff you know we're going to get more into that kind of merchandise and that kind of image and stuff like that so which is kind of the other page of it you know growing up in the 60s and yeah i'm the old guy 60s and 70s you know we actually <laughs> are proud to embrace being what was called monster kids you know what i mean because that was people don't realize what a big deal that was back in the 60s because mm -hmm. Because those things had just entered the public domain or had just gotten, you know, picked up for um, distribution here in the U.S. So every local TV market seemed to have their own horror host, you know, kind of thing. Like the big ones have gone on to, you know, Zachary, the Groovy Ghoul, Elvira, mm -hmm. you know, Vampira back one of the original ones, you know. The, you know, Elvira, of course, being the mistress of the dark, a later iteration of that, you know, but they, that, that was a huge thing in the monster, you know, the Friday night creature features and all that stuff, you know, the, that was just every market had that. And now that continues on with like Dr. Gangrene and, you know, that, you know, what are the others, some of the others I'm thinking of, you know, so just the still are ongoing. So. So just I love that stuff, and we just kind of really want to get into that kind of thing too. And I think that just broadens our market. I've talked to people. Hey, I won't stop. And we'll necessarily go into a comic store, but I'll go into a monster store. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think we'll just widen our appeal with that kind of stuff. So, and of course, you know that leads into my other first love was the model kit building. You know, which mm -hmm. I'm kind of limited on now, but that. Create, that was a second side of that monster thing was the Aurora monster model kits. You know, that's where I cut my modeling teeth on <laughs> as a kid, you know, and I just absolutely love it and hope to be able to get back to that someday. And, you know, just, and I want to get into that hobby side of it too, you know, with the model building with the more of the pop culture, not much of a military guy, you know, I mean, that's the whole another side of it you know that their talent is just immense and amazing but it's just not my forte or my area of interest really you know just more to the superhero monster model kit builds and figures so hope to get more into that again so all right well what other questions do you guys have for for no man's land while he's here with us there you go <laughs> Make i think that's all i've appearance. got <laughs> that's all i've got too i, I just you're good look forward to it okay yeah okay, we're definitely yeah, definitely looking forward to it oh me too yeah i'm glad to be to be making the move i'm super excited about it i think the future you know to quote the 80s song 
or the uh, future so bright, I got to wear shades. <laughs> so I, I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. And um, glad to be back and part of the Compass, Campus Comics cast for the 100th episode. I do, you know, we got to keep the name going somehow, Campus oh, yeah. Comics, you know. So, so we're uh, going to, you're right. going to continue to do business as Campus Comics yes, in I've addition to, to yes. Yes, I'm keeping the DBA name, Campus Comics. My Diamond account is still Campus Comics. You know, I haven't changed that. Just the shipping address has changed, but still account number 30074. Yeah, CGC is still listed as Campus Comics as well. So, yep. yep. So they just do ship the ship to the, the new store under new that name. So mm-hmm. that Campus Comics isn't dead. Yep. I know there was a big newspaper write-up about the move because, you know, that's the thing, too, is... You know, my wife is like, well, why isn't Sarah's, you know, business getting any coverage like that? I'm like, well, you got to realize, you know, it's an almost 40 year business mm-hmm. that's been in Carbondale, yep. pulled up roots, you know, and, and left to go to Murfreesboro, you know. So there, it's it's kind of sad to see. But, you know, you, we've seen that happen to Carbondale, unfortunately, way more than I like to think about, you know, is, you know, if you stop and think at the old location between Campus Comics Mike's music and Plaza Records, that's nearly a hundred years, you know, combine those years of service, mm-hmm. you know, that's nearly a century mm-hmm. worth of businesses there, you know, and those are some of the original Carbondale businesses left were in that little strip mall, mm-hmm. you know, but with those three businesses, you know, we got now, you know, what uh, what can I think of here? You know, Quattro's, Pizza, mm-hmm. Paglia, Pally Eyes. You know, but but when you think Pinch is gone and, you know, Uh Copper Dragon as a venue is gone and Arnold's Market, you know, the, the, you know, the one of Carbondale's claims to fame was, you know, was what was the inspiration for National Lampoon's Animal House, you know, back in (laughs) what, 77, 78, because of the Carbondale Party School. That's right. John Belushi came down to visit his brother, Jim Belushi, while he was going to school here. And he bought the sweat, the famous sweatshirt that he wore in Animal House, just huh. said college on it. That was actually <laughs> made at a little print shop called Gusto's there on the strip oh. in Carbondale. Gusto's doesn't even exist anymore, guys. No. You know, so it's just, it's sad. You know, there for a while it, it relocated to Murfreesboro, of all things, Murfreesboro hmm. area. That sounds but familiar. Gusto's is gone, you know, and. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so, but we won't be gone like no. Gusto. But there you know, you it's go. just sad that so much of the heritage, so much of what made Carbondale, Carbondale is is going away. You know what I mean? And I hated to do that, but also the time was right. You know, yeah. just for my personal reasons. You know, and other factors. You know, that were just there. So. God bless Carbondale. I hope they, you know, have a resurgence. But, but just with the fact that I live here and, mm-hmm. you know, it's easier for my personal situation, I feel like it was the right move. Yeah, I, feel, I really do. But, but well, speaking uh, speaking of big ahead. changes, I was gonna say, well, I was gonna say, mm-hmm. speaking of big changes, so uh, Penguin Random House yes. and Carbondale. Mm-hmm jointly announced back on march 25th and i'm just going to kind of read the first paragraph of this of this press statement here marvel comics and penguin random house publisher services um the renowned trade book publisher today announced an exclusive worldwide multi-year sales and distribution agreement for marvel's newly published and backlist comic books trade collections and graphic uh, graphic novels to comic shops known as the direct market uh, Penguin mm-hmm. Random House officially begins its distribution to direct market retailers for all Marvel titles starting October 1st. And this is coming on the heels of DC, of course, moving their distribution um, away yeah. from um, um, Diamond over to Lunar. So I guess, um, you know, what are, you know, you as the shop owner, what are your thoughts on this announcement? Uh um, well, I got to say that one of the things that happened from this is it's, I don't want to spend time bashing, but I think this is just a result of kind of some of the, a little bit of long-term instant karma for what kind of diamonds had 
going on here there for a while and uh it, it's kind of weird it's a, one of the first times or the only time i can remember ever getting an active call from a person at diamond actually <laughs> called me uns to say hey hey you know you can still get your book your marvel stuff you'll still be able to get your marvel stuff here through diamond you know so he's and so he went on to ask me, he said, what, you know, do you have any questions for me? And I said, well, I mean, when you're trying to run a comic book store, it all comes down to, to cost. You know, yeah, we know what the service has been like with Diamond. But now, yeah, we can still get books from Diamond. But the way I read it is the Penguin Random House is an exclusive distributorship. So that indicates to me that Diamond would just serve as a middleman between yeah. Penguin Random House and the comp the direct market. I said, so how's that going to affect my discount? You know, are you just doing this out of the kindness of your heart? Or, you know, is it going to be, a, am I going to get the same discount from you as you being Diamond as I'm going to get from Penguin Random House? Second part of that is Penguin Random House won't charge shipping. Mm -hmm. Will your shipping be free now? You know, oh, I don't know about the free shipping or anything. And he said, but, you know, he would get back to me on my question about the discount. Because I just can't, unless it does, I don't see any benefit to staying mm -hmm. with, with Diamond, mm -hmm. you know. And the other part to that is, is, um, I, I don't know what this is how this is going to affect a lunar either. You know what I mean? Because because they handle the distribution of the comic market to the direct market. You know, for DC for the DC side of it, whereas the distributorship of their trades and everything has already actually gone over to Penguin Random House. You know, for that. So kind of Diamond was already a secondary distributor for the trades with Random House. But I, from what I understand, I don't know fully, but from what I understand is if there are changes to Marvel's, I forget whether the two Marvel's distributorship and everything, they have to offer, I think DC had the foresight to write into their agreement with Lunar that they have to offer at least as favorable a deal to DC as they did, uh, to Marvel as they did to DC. There we go. Mm -hmm. They have to offer at least as favorable a deal to Marvel as they did to Lunar or to mm -hmm. Random House as they did to Lunar. I don't know. I'm getting myself confused even thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. But what basically what I think is it doesn't paint a particularly great picture for Lunar either, because I think they have to offer at least as favorable a deal to Penguin Random House has to offer Marvel at least as favorable a deal to, as they did to DC. I don't know, or vice versa or something. Right. But I wish Matt Martin was here. He explained it to me. <laughs> I wish Matt, one of our other alums, was still here because he explained it to me into a way that I understood, which obviously I can't explain <laughs> <laughs> now because I've slept since then and my brain is not right. So, so but I so guess anyway. So, yeah. So like DC used to be about you know what forty ish percent yes. of Diamond's mm -hmm. business, and you yes. got to figure Marvel was if not. As much as fifty percent, at least forty to forty-five percent. Yes. As well. Mm -hmm. So now Diamond mm -hmm. has lost at least eighty percent of their book distribution. Yes. Yeah, that doesn't look particularly favorable for Diamond long term. I, I I can't imagine a distributor being able to continue to do what they do when their big dog is what Dark Horse and Image. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So which. You know, every other publisher after Marvel and DC made up 20% of the market, you know. If to, that. Yeah, if that. Mm -hmm. So I just can't imagine that Diamond is going to be able to continue to exist in the form they're existing, you know, 
just carrying, you know, like I said, when the next biggest distributors are Image, Dark Horse, IDW, and Dynamite, you know. So it just, I don't, I don't know. I had heard, I don't know if this is a rumor mill, so I don't even know if I want to throw it out there, but I had heard that the Geppy family was trying to get the license to publish Marvel books, you know, Marvel comics. So if they would snare that, that would save Diamond's the fat, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So they would be basically serving just like what a dynamite does or you know an idw does whereas right. they don't own those characters they publish they just have the license to publish the comics you know so if diamond in one way or another would secure those licensing rights you know to publish marvel comics that might be enough you know to keep them at least a little similar to what they're doing so I guess do you already have your uh, Penguin Random House account set so up already. That's my thought on that. Has anybody else heard anything about that or anything? No. Uh, do you do you already have your Penguin Random House account set? I think I might be frozen up here. Uh oh. So do you have your Penguin Random House account set up yet? I think we must have lost Mike. So, <laughs> but hey, we got through the important part. That's so, right. so I, I think we're good. So okay, I think oh, I'm, oh are you back? Okay, good. You snuck back in. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm back now. I think it was having trouble. I've been having trouble. I think it's time for a new router here on my <laughs> Wi-Fi. So okay. I think we've been having some trouble with that. Well, I have one more question for you. So, so have you set up your okay. random house account yet? I have not. Okay, we'll get on that. Uh, yeah. no, I know. <laughs> I know. A few other things going on here, Scott. Right? I hadn't heard. <laughs> but no, I do need to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. You're not the first one to say that either. Yeah. From the because they're October. Matt Martin, he was just like, yeah. Yeah. Because October is so, when that starts. So that's what? It's less yeah. than six months. So, no, and of yeah, course, orders sure. being so, two months in advance. So, you know, it's right. Even, even shortens the time there. So, <laughs> so you can yeah, wait till after sure. the grand opening. I, I'll give you oh, permission. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh goodness, but no, I have not done that, but okay. I do need to. Well, all right. So, no man, would is there anything all else right. you'd like to share with the two people that listen to this? <laughs> oh, it's oh, at yeah. least three people now. <laughs> it's three people. Okay. I, all right. No, I, re I really don't. I do. Oh, I'm, one thing I do want to do want to talk about too is uh, whereas I might not be able to join you every time with the with the podcast here, the Campus Comics cast, one of the things I have talked to Tyler Wright about doing is coming up with a, a separate theme song. And what I think I might do, Scott, is just either invest in my own digital recorder or buy yours or anybody that wants to be part of them as well. Mm -hmm. I think what I, what I'm talking about doing is, is doing what we might call the leaving at the campus comics cast as we discussed, but I might do muddy monster mini sodes, you know, and just do like short 15 to 20 minute mini episodes about other things. You know, it might be about, the muddy monster sightings or it might be just short little mini reviews of you know the, the universal monster movies or or the monster models or just different areas of interest you know with the the classic horror or the cryptid type of stuff or whatever or just little promotions doing just just separate episodes you know within the campus comics cast that will not be a problem to do at all. So all that right. sounds and very much like your own podcast network, Mike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Only there a few go. years after starting, maybe branching out into branching. a network Expanding. of podcasts. Yeah. 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 So yeah, gonna... I think that that's the working title as we're calling just the, <laughs> the the Muddy Monster mini sodes, you know, just fifteen right. to twenty minute short things, you know, that I just may want to go off on other little tangents about. And like I said, I'll just do those on my own if anybody else wants to be part of that more than welcome as well i don't know shad as as well i know i don't believe scott and 
like or too much of the horror aficionados or anything like that. But I don't know about your proclivities, Chad. I know you're <laughs> along for the ride with uh, more Absolutely. of the indie kind of beat of the comics. So. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoy the a uh, horror comic or two every once in a while. I okay. like to dive into those. So yeah, I'd be down for sure. Yep. All right, yeah. And I don't know if how you are with the classic monster movies or anything or what your attachment is to any of those kind of properties. But yeah, any of the, any of you guys want to be part of that? Groovy any man. any yeah. excuse to to revisit some of those great Abbott and Costello crossovers oh, with the oh werewolf the or the Wolfman and, and oh, those, that, are, those are some of my stuff. favorites. <laughs> yeah, that's a good th- that's a good thing. That's a good call on that, Mike. Yeah, that'd be fun. That'd be super. Oh, fun. That, that's that's my yeah. very small niche when it comes to monster movies and the monster <laughs> oh, okay. market or whatever. But I would love to take part in so- certain episodes that oh, that involve yeah, them, and great. it gives me an excuse to to you know pull those up and and watch them again. Mm-hmm. And I just rewatched all the right. you know the Universal yeah. had that Blu-ray box set, and I just rewa- I just got yeah. that watched all of those main monster movies. Mm-hmm. So other than the, the too much generation. opera and Phantom of the Opera, you know it yeah. was. Uh... <laughs> well, you got to get away from the Claude Rains, man. You got to yeah. go back yeah. to you got to watch the original Lon Chaney silent mm-hmm. movie, man. It holds up and it holds <laughs> up incredibly well. Right. You know that Lon Chaney <laughs> silent movie, so good. Yeah, but we will definitely make that happen. So. All right. Very good. All right. All right. So. All right. Well, do you want to? I think that's all I got. All right. So, do you want to stick around and uh, while we talk about a 100th issue, or are you gonna you gonna bow out at this point? I will probably bow out here okay. gracefully or not so gracefully if you right. see me move around too much anymore. But, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I actually have a, a night here. Actually, Debbie went over to visit Sarah and the granddaughter at her place. So I've just got the run of the place by myself. So I'll probably throw, actually I've gone back and in a, been in the mood of the muddy monster. I actually went back and rewatched one of the favorites from my childhood. Uh, I don't know if you know a movie called the legend of boggy Creek. If you've ever heard of that, you know, heard of it. I'm going to talk about, but what that is, is it's kind of a docudrama about the Falk monster, which is very similar to the big muddy monster and, you know, a creature, the Falk, you know, it's a Bigfoot type creature in Falk, Arkansas. You know, there's several sightings. It's a docudrama about that. So probably going to throw that on there and give it a watch. So Good deal. <laughs> nice. step out. Maybe we'll have a review of that once. Have you ever seen that, Mike? At no, no, I know of it, but I've never, like like Scott, I've not it's seen fun, it. It's a fun watch, yeah. I mean, it, it's just staged interviews, the interviews with the actual witnesses and everything, but then they do staged recreation. It's, it's much like the Unsolved Mysteries of its day, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Actually had a, yeah, and so I'll probably check that out. So right, good. probably going to finish watching that here, so. All right, guys, it's been great. Thanks for right. keeping this going for 100 episodes. I know Dan... Uh, had previously said, I sure never thought, you know, they'd be doing it this this yep. podcast for this long, but I'm certainly glad they are. I'm glad you guys like doing it. Yep. And I appreciate everything you do, guys. All right. So have a good one. Thanks, Mike. Likewise. Right. Thanks, Mike. It's great, Thanks, to, great Mike. to talk with you. All right. It's good to be part of it again. We'll talk soon. All right. All right, buddy. See ya. All right. So since this is the 100th episode, we thought we had to do something special for number 100. So um, what we decided to do was each of us pick a issue number 100 that we would at least give a little bit of a rundown and and uh, talk about. So I feel like I've been kind of monopolizing the conversation here a little bit. So why don't we let, uh, I don't know, Shad, you want to go first on your sure. 100th issue? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, I picked the Walking Dead issue 100 uh, for my issue 100. And uh, so that one is. Uh, the issue that is kind of known, it's the introduction of Negan. Uh, it's the the kind of, I guess, the big bad for the entire series as it ends up being. He's uh, a, a unique character. I'm sure most people know whether it's from the comics or from the TV show, but uh, really kind of challenges the group. Uh, and I was as I was rereading it, he doesn't even show up until about halfway through the issue. So it's uh, they kind of really pull that taffy on there. Uh, but you, you get Negan's introduction as well as Lucille, the bat with the barbed wire wrapped around it. And, uh, and you, uh, you get to know pretty quickly that Negan uses a lot of choice words <laughs> and, uh, becomes kind of his, his, uh, his entertaining factor, I guess it's the, 
the thing that makes you uh, forget that he's a kind of a horrible person um, is that like, oh, he's got a talent for stringing words together that don't make any sense. And uh, it seemed Robert Kirkman has said before you know, in interviews how much he enjoys uh, writing that character because of all of the random things he gets to make him say <laughs> and uh, that that kind of version. Uh, but uh, yeah, and I think I'd kind of rereading that issue, you really kind of it's one of the first times that I start questioning uh, whether Rick and his group are really good guys, because you get kind of this reflection of his group in what the saviors are, Negan's group, and uh, and go, well, are these guys really doing that good? Or are they also just going into different towns and taking over and saying, give us your food and give us things? Mm-hmm. And uh, so it, it seems like the first time you really kind of challenge uh, whether whether our protagonists really are protagonists in the story of Walking Dead. Um but and so there's there's a good mixture of of the funny of of that character and just the horrible uh, just wrath that comes with Negan and that all out, all out war storyline. Um, and we we lose a main a, a major character mm-hmm. that's been with us since I think issue two uh, in in Glenn uh, is taken out by by Negan and that. So spoilers. Right. Sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. I should say. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, pretty iconic uh, issue uh, when in the Walking Dead world, and uh, you know if you kind of go side by side with the TV show, pretty big uh, event that everybody was looking forward to on the TV show as well. So I remember having a graded copy of that book, um, and I was at the Superman celebration. Okay, there, and I had that graded copy sitting there, and this girl comes by the table and picks it up, and I said, "Don't read that." <laughs> top part of that unless you want to get spoiled <laughs> he kept reading and is like oh my god why did you tell me it's like i did tell you so yeah uh, i i remember reading that issue i was reading walking dead in trade you know okay yeah time, because it was just easier for me to just to, just to read it and trade yeah that makes and sense. Uh, i uh you know i had, had been reading all the trades up until that point and that to me was the trade that where they jumped the shark. <laughs> yeah. It got remember, a little wild. Well, it's not that it's not so much that it got wild. I remember reading that and then the scene where Glenn is actually killed, I felt like that scene went on for like six or seven pages. It just <laughs> felt like it went on forever. Yeah. And I and it was like it was almost like it was all, all it was about just about the violence in the book. It's for very me. Yeah, so just gore driven, yeah. Yeah, and it kind of, you know, I've, it's like there's a couple of things that, you know, most of the time the original is better than what mimics or, you know, comes after. Mm-hmm. And it's like for me, like the Walking Dead TV series typically was better t- for me than like the Walking Dead comic was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, I mean, obviously it, it took its roots from those comics. But yeah, that, that issue 100 is a. Uh, is one where just like I was, I, I think I read maybe the next trade after that, and I was just like, yeah, I think I'm done because, yeah, Deegan was too much for me, you know. <laughs> I just he was just, and I was concerned when the when the series got to Negan. It's like, I don't yeah. know if I'm able to keep watching this or not. So, but they fortunately picked a pretty good actor to play him. So. Yeah, they did. Jeffrey Dean Morgan does a really good job. Oh, yeah, he's great. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness so but yeah all right so uh atch what are you thinking about for your 100th oh gosh you know i must have misunderstood the the direction i thought you said to review every uh 100th issue that you have in your collection oh okay <laughs> all right so no uh, I, I i did though i had to go through my little database and try to find one the issue 100s that i did have because you know when you think about it some of the older titles issue 100s are pretty rare you know your actions mm-hmm. detective superman batman whatever but uh you know th- th- then your newer ones i didn't have many of the like second volumes of stuff but i did look up and i found 10 different titles that i had 100 the 100th issue of one was showcase and uh showcase 100 was w- unique in that it had every character that appeared in showcase in the previous 99 issues as part of the story. Uh, I forget who the uh, writer was, but it was uh, art by uh, uh, Joe Staten, which was really cool. I had fables 100. Yeah. Which was, okay. you know, everybody was looking forward to that. As a matter of fact, I think Bill Willingham was planning on ending the series with 100, but he just couldn't stop. And then I had there, you remember in the nineties when you had these foil covers, uh, 
with these unique sort of titles with silhouettes of the characters. I had three of them. You had Green Arrow, where, where angels fear to tread, The Flash, The Quick and the Dead, and Superman, The Death of Clark Kent. I had those. Uh, I had Ghost 100. Not very much to talk about there. <laughs> had Warlord 100. Also, oh. yeah, it was past his prime by then. Yeah. Had Superboy. That's one of the older ones, the Silver Age, uh, the, the original uh, series. And it was a 12-cent comic, so I'm guessing it probably was early 60s. And then Doom Patrol number 100. Now, if it was Doom Patrol 99, that was the first appearance of Beast Boy, which would have made it really interesting. But otherwise, it was pretty anticlimactic. But my favorite of the bunch there was Green Green Lantern 100, which had this magnificent cover by uh, uh, Mike Grell, which featured Green Arrow, Green Lantern, Black Canary, and then Green Lantern's cousin airwave so you probably you'd recognize it i think if you've seen it but anyway the one i picked though which before even scott could get the words out of his mouth about he he was like all right atchison i know you're going to pick justice league of america number 100 and i'm like all right if you insist so (laughs) but full disclosure this is like a three issue arc and i can't really i mean if i synopsize i do have it synopsized but you know (laughs) Shad, if you had spent a little bit more time on yours, I probably would have felt a little bit better about going through all three issues, but <laughs> I, I don't think I can do that to the crowd. I'm trying not to lose <laughs> listeners. Uh, but it's it's essentially, at that point in, in, in issue 100s, we're starting to become, you know, our cent, you know every 100 issues, that was becoming a big thing. But this, I, I wasn't old enough to buy off the racks. I was, I bought it as a back issue, probably about you know, whenever I was old enough in the mid to late seventies to mow grass and have my own money, I bought it from Mile High Comics. But the cover is classic. It's it's a Nick Cardi cover and it's got the Justice League and the Justice Society. This being of course their their one the one hundredth meeting of the Justice League, but all but the tenth, uh, I think, you know, reunion between the two teams. But they're standing over the grave of a stone of a, someone called the unknown soldier of victory and then in the back part of the cover, it's got the seven soldiers of victory, which were a golden age team that hadn't appeared in, you know, probably at that time, 25 years. And the, I remember, uh, you know, the, of course, the, your typical uh, way that the two, the Justice Society and Justice League would get together is one of the one team or the other would accidentally or somehow have to cross over from Earth one to Earth two or vice versa. So. They did that, but the the whole premise was that uh, they, you know, the ju- no one could remember that who these these seven soldiers of victory guys were. Their memories had been wiped somehow, and anyway, they had these guys had basically back in the 40s retroactively, of course, been lost in time fighting someone called the Nebula Man. And anyway, that's our big bad in this story again. And you had your typical typical, uh, even though Len Wein was the author, he did maintain the the Gardner Fox trope of splitting up the team into duos or trios, which was you almost have to, you know, to tell the story because you had like 33 characters, heroes in this story. (laughs) But I'm telling you that this had such an effect on me as a kid that, you know, I think that's probably the book or the storyline that really prompted me to just keep trying to pursue these Justice League books. Um, uh, So, like I said, uh, you know, you Long story short, they all team up. They find uh, the seven soldiers lost in time. They bring them back. They all remember them all of a sudden. It's over 101 or 100, 101, and 102. And uh, just to tell you who these seven soldiers are, by the way, there was a very um, cool during in the story. They, 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 the, the Oracle, which is sort of the narrator in the story, he dramatically introduces them as the vigilante, A.K. Greg Saunders, the prairie troubadour who fought crimes of the city with weapons of the plains and the star spangled kid and stripesy actually wealthy young Sylvester Pemberton and his bodyguard chauffeur Pat Dugan. And, you know, it's just that kind of, you just don't get, it uh, sounds hokey now, but trust me, it was really cool then. And to me, it's still cool. Mm-hmm. And he they introduced, you know, they go on to introduce um, uh, the Crimson Avenger and uh, the shiny Knight mm-hmm. and, Green Arrow and Speedy, the original Green Arrow and Speedy, you know, the Golden Age. And they were, so that's seven soldiers. It turns out the unknown soldier of victory was, are, are also known as the eighth soldier of victory, was Crimson Avengers' young ward, Wing. He had died back in the 40s, and it was a great little mystery. It was it was a lot of fun. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of neat little things you could I could talk about about you know everything from Johnny Thunder. Um, I, it was the first time I realized whenever he would call up the Thunderbolt, he'd say "say you," but it was always spelled like C E I dash U. But phonetically, that was like you know how they said it, Shad, in the '40s. Say you, man. You know, he, mm-hmm. it's like us yeah. nowadays saying "hey." It's like "say you," you know. But that was that was a little little verbal deal that they had there that um, you know made it cool. Uh, you know, there's you know, they had a, a, a very rare appearance of the Earth 2 Robin, and he wore that really awful Batman Robin <laughs> al- amalgamation uh, version of his costume. Um, it was just just a lot of fun. Uh, Red Tornado was not a favorite character to many people, but uh, he did um, sacrifice himself at the end of the story. Uh, it's not a great, not a super complex plot, but it was a lot of fun. And Dick Dillon, this is probably at his height. This guy could, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, Shad, but he was, he did like 60 issues of the Justice League. And mm-hmm. you think about all those characters. And then once in a while, he'd throw in a World's Finest or, a, you know, a Blackhawk comic or something in, in between. Um, so it, it, was, it, it was a lot of fun. And anybody that, if you've got that DC Universe Infinite or whatever it's yeah. called, uh, Go back, go back. That's what I reread it on. I didn't dig up my original issues. <laughs> I reread it on, on there, and, and and you'll you'll see what I'm talking about. So yeah, I'll pull it up tonight. That sounds cool. That's a that's a giant cast of of people in there. Oh my gosh, and a lot of cool cameos. I mean, you had because it was the hundredth issue. They brought in people that had been like guest stars before, like Elongated Man. He actually joined a couple day a uh, couple issues later. They brought in uh, Martian Manhunter who had quit in a previous couple of years, like a, a 10 or 12 issues before they brought in, um, Oh, Adam strange. He was always like a guest star metamorpho who kind of turned him down for membership. So it was just a fanboy's delight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess it's me. So, and a big surprise, it's almost as much of a surprise as uh, Mike choosing justice league 100. <laughs> Uh, I chose Captain America issue number 100, and though you can't see it, there's my graded copy of it because you Mm. can't see it because of my blurred background. But um, so this was an interesting book because this came 1968 and Marvel had just gotten out of this distribution agreement with, of all companies, DC Comics. DC was distributing, you know, Marvel books, and uh, they basically told Marvel that, hey, we'll let you do eight books. So for a good portion of the 60s, Marvel was only releasing about eight comic books. That's why we had like Tales of Suspense, where you had Captain America and Iron Man. So you had two heroes, one book. Tales to Astonish, which you had where it's like a it was like Hulk and Submarine at this time. So we had all these combination books. So Marvel got out from underneath that agreement and basically gave a lot of these characters their own their own books. So Captain America, unlike some of the others, like um, Iron Man, where it started over at issue number one. Captain America maintained the numbering of Tales of Suspense, and the previous issue was 99, so this became Captain America 100 um, for this issue. So, um, you know, and and comics at this time, they were still of the mind that every single every single comic was potentially somebody's first comic book that they ever read. So they spend a lot of time, you know, they basically reintroduce Captain America. And, and kind of retell his origin from where he comes back to the Marvel Universe in Avengers 4. And they, they spend the first three and a half pages of this book just recounting uh, kind of that origin story where we where, you know, he's found in the ice and Submariner throws him into the water and he starts to melt. And the Avengers find him in a submarine and pull him in and he revives and and then joins the Avengers and eventually becomes a leader of the team. So they, they kind of recant, they, you know, retell that story. But uh, then, you know, Cap kind of wakes up from having been stunned. And here we get the continuation of what was actually going on in Tales of Suspense 99, where uh, he's been stunned by somebody as uh, pretending to be Baron Zemo, uh, we learn later on. So, you know, an old uh, villain who was also responsible for the death of Bucky. So and there's this blonde woman here that actually is the one who's holding a gun uh, on him. Uh, whose, whose name in this is Irma Cruel, K H or K R U H L. So you got that uh, <laughs> unique unique uh, spelling on that. 
but uh, uh, who turns out to actually be, and we're not, it's not like a big surprise. It's she's basically has her own thought bubbles and she's saying that, oh, she can't shoot Captain America because she's Agent 13 and who was introduced back in Tales of Suspense 66, 67, I think. I can't remember exactly. Um, who later is known as Sharon Carter. So this has got uh, Sharon Carter in it and, and basically, you know, Cap teaming up with the Black Panther going up against Baron Zemo. And of course, Sharon Carter, there's his age of age of the shield. And we've got a, a brief appearance by Nick Fury in this book. And, you know, after Panther and, and Black Panther and Captain America defeat Zemo, you find that it's not actually Zemo. It was Zemo's pilot because Baron Zemo was dead. And he just took on the, you know, the costume and, uh, and all that, all that good stuff. And then you get to read, you know, the, the team back up with uh, Sharon Carter, who at this point, whenever this series kind of continues and uh you know it's amazing what you do and don't remember from comics that you've read 20 15 20 years ago and how you remember them and how they are now so a while back i started back reading captain america at issue 100 why i didn't go back to tells the suspense i don't know um but i started at captain america 100 and man for the first 40 50 issues of captain america it's a romance comic it's it's a romance comic <laughs> with superheroes in it because it's constantly what's going on between Captain America and Sharon Carter. So, uh, but anyway, you know, this Captain America being my favorite character, it's kind of hard not to, whenever there is a 100th issue uh, to choose, you know, to celebrate the 100th episode of the Campus Comics cast, it's kind of hard not to choose that uh, book, you know, just like, Mike, you had to, you know, choose right. Justice League of America. I don't blame you. And, and just to, <laughs> about the romance uh, genre, that was still very prominent at mm-hmm. the time that this issue came out. Um, mm-hmm. It wasn't until early to mid 70s that they actually kind of went, it went out of uh, style, but yeah, it was. I remember uh, several different com, uh, you know, series that were romance centric, and man, they. I think they sold pretty good. Well, I mean, obviously the numbers were strong enough for them to keep going on that kind of concept sure. for you know quite a few issues. So. And you think about, I mean, a lot of the Lois Lane Superman stories were that way. I mean, it was yeah. always Lois fawning or mm-hmm. fawning over over him or how to fool fool him into marrying her or right. you know, or like Lois that. Atlanta having the competition. It was like a whole Betty Veronica Archie thing, you know. So <laughs> well, you know, this this wouldn't the, the romance part of this would not hold up because a lot of the time spent <laughs> in the Cap Sharon romance is Cap telling Sharon, you can't keep working as a shield agent. It's too dangerous. <laughs> you know, so so yeah, that that really wouldn't fly, you know, with a modern reader, but uh but yeah, so <laughs> That's a good one. It, it does get to the point too where they talk where they both say, Well, maybe we both should hang it up so we can we can be together, you know. So <laughs> I'm thinking we need to come to an agreement and for future episodes that whatever pick we have for a review, we all need to read the other ones. The other yeah. person's yeah. other cast members picks that'd well, be awesome the the you know for this one you know the focus was on the news about the shop you know so sure. um and and i expected that to take a fair amount of time so i think if we were all to have uh read each and then talk about them and i've read walking dead 100 mm-hmm. so now i have yeah. not read just the league of america 100 so um but uh but but yeah so anyway uh, all right so we done we good i think so yeah, I think it covers things pretty good, yeah. Okay, well, uh, Mike, where can they find you online? Oh, you know. <laughs> at the Twitter. Yeah, Mike <laughs> Atchison5 at, at on Twitter. So, yeah, hit me Shad? up. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and all those things, at Shad Schubert, that's S-H-A-A-D-S-C-H-U-B-E-R-T. Um, and you can check out my band, the can't get rights and my other show, IFNZ podcast and Scott Reed. You can find me at Berg comics.com B U R G comics.com has links to all my social media sites. And of course, this is the campus comics cast, which, uh, is now affiliated with muddy monster comics and collectibles. 
which is located at 1422 Walnut Street in Murfreesboro, Illinois. The phone number is still 618-457-6011, so you can call Mike No. Um, the grand opening of the store is going to happen on May 1st, uh, Saturday, May 1st, which as we record this is just a couple of weeks and a couple of days away. So actually, it's not even that long. It's one week and a couple of days yeah. away, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I'm, you know, even wrong on that. So yeah. So May first coming up really, really soon. Um, which you know, in pri- pre-COVID would have been also free comic book day, but that has now been pushed back. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah. So be sure if you're hearing this and you can make it uh, to Muddy Monster Comics and Collectibles on May first. I uh, would love for you to be there. I'm definitely going to be at the store helping Mike out. Um, and uh, so you can stop in and say hi. And I don't know if you guys are going to stop in at any point on that day or not. Yeah, hopefully I'll Ho- be getting to pop in every once in a while. I don't, I've got a couple of things going on, but hope oh, yeah. to be there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm the same way. I've got something. My daughter's got something I'm going to go to in the morning, but uh, I might be able to make it there by the, you know, by early afternoon. Sounds good. So, all right. So, thanks for listening, and we will talk to you soon. just to kind of set up everything and talk about the changes and I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll just let you ask me and we'll just okay. ask me leading questions for okay. my own style here so you can ask me okay. leading questions so and then we can all just kind of chime in I've, I've got a handful of questions that I'll sure. ask um, okay. and, um, so what we'll do is um, I'll go ahead and, and do the intro and we'll announce you know I'll say myself and then Atchison and then Shad and then, and then Mike you'll go last button that has like a handset a phone handset on it and yes. that's, uh-huh. that's like the leave so don't cut, cut okay. that but, <laughs> but whatever you're done no, with no, no. It, yeah you can, you can rage quit and uh, just push that okay. button <laughs> But then we're going to talk about getting the slamming door sound effect. Exactly right. Yeah.